All right. Wonderful. So I, I think we will get started and I am absolutely delighted to welcome everyone to this breakout session. I hope that you enjoyed the main uh, session that you would have just attended. I would say the theme that I took away from that is hope that uh, with all of the expertise and compassion uh, here at the Ottawa Hospital, there is this wonderful uh, theme of hope. And I hope that our breakout session on prostate cancer only continues that theme. I could not be more delighted to introduce you to three of our incredible experts at the Ottawa Hospital who have dedicated their careers to caring for prostate cancer patients and uh, the incredible research that takes place as well. My name is Jennifer Van Nord. I am a Vice President of Philanthropy at the Ottawa Hospital. Uh, this uh, topic hits close to home. I, my grandfather and my uncle both had prostate cancer and so I have been deeply inspired by our experts. I would be remiss not to welcome all of our donors who have been so generous in supporting prostate cancer and in particular would be remiss not to acknowledge those that are joining us from the Ride for Dad Prostate Cancer Fight Foundation, the Prostate Cancer Ottawa Network and the Black Walnut in Winchester. These men and women have been so supportive of all of our efforts around prostate cancer uh, research and patient care over so many years, it is absolutely humbling to see what they have accomplished. I'm going to give just a couple of moments of uh, just 30 seconds of housekeeping, which is I encourage you to ask away, ask your questions, just enter a question into the Q&A uh, function and we'll do our best to get those answered uh, for you. I've already received a couple of questions, so I'll kick things off with those. With just a moment to go at the end, I'm going to invite uh, some closing remarks from our CEO, uh, Tim Kluke. Um, I would encourage you to avoid a personal question about your own healthcare experience that's best left uh, to your medical professionals. And so um, what I would say, though, is if we don't get to your question today because of time, we will help uh, answer that privately and navigate uh, you through getting those answers. And so with that, I am delighted to introduce our experts. So Dr. Chris Marash, Head of Urologic Oncology at the Ottawa Hospital, Medical Director of the Ottawa Prostate Cancer Assessment at Center, head of the prostate robotics program at the Ottawa Hospital, and chairs a number of committees, uh, including the GU Cancer Multidisciplinary Group. He will be well known to many patients and families in Ottawa because he can often be seen in multiple church basements and hotel lobbies and with his peers educating and informing uh, those in our city about what we are doing at the Ottawa Hospital when it comes to prostate cancer. You have given countless hours and it's so deeply appreciated. And I'm not convinced you have the ability to say no because you've been that gracious with your time. And I would be remiss not to share a fun fact that you are addicted, that's your word, to your Peloton. And I think how fantastic that you're living what you preach. Take care of yourself, stay active, and especially in a time like this with the pandemic. I think that's great advice to follow. Our second expert, welcome Dr. Marash. Our second expert is Dr. Michael Long, a medical oncologist and clinical investigator at the Ottawa Hospital uh, Cancer Center. Um, his research is focused on targeted and immunotherapy drug development for prostate, melanoma, and bladder cancers. He is the current chair of a national investor and in initiated multi-centered trial called Radiant. Again, uh, has served on multiple um, uh, clinical trial boards. And I would say he too, Dr. Ong, it's been so lovely that you have also been so gracious with your time. I know when you did a recent radio interview for us, the radio interviewer thought you could have a second job as a radio personality. You did such a great job in explaining your work. And as a fun fact that I think is so fitting, you shared the story of your first son being born very quietly in the middle of the night at a large um, uh, uh, teaching hospital in London, England, and your second son being born in a bit of chaos in the middle of, uh, in your car on the way to the hospital when you were practicing medicine. And I thought, how fitting that your sons are so individualized and that what you're preaching is individual cancer medicine for all. So welcome, Dr. Ong. And finally, uh, welcome, Dr. Scott Morgan. Again, so gracious with your time as well. You've been given countless, countless hours to education and inspiration. Radiation oncologist at the Ottawa Hospital Cancer Center. In 2020, Dr. Morgan was appointed to the guideline subcommittee of the American Society for Radiation Oncology. Also sits on a steering committee for three large prostate cancer clinical trials. 
and has kindly given so much time to sit on um, our GU uh, steering committees and uh, research groups and given countless hours to our patients. And again, like Dr. Morash, I, I commend you, a keen tennis player you are, you are, how wonderful that the courts are now opening and that you too are living what you preach to stay active, especially in our, in our pandemic. Um, with that, I could not be more excited for the experts that we have here and we're gonna dive right in. I would like you to get to hear from them for just a couple of moments before we ask some questions. And so Dr. Morash, I wonder if I could invite you and then Dr. Ong and then Dr. Morgan to share just for a few moments why you are so passionate about the work you do. Why, what motivates you? What gives you hope? Why here at the Ottawa Hospital as well? So Dr. Morash, could I invite you to start? Absolutely, my pleasure. Uh, thanks, Jennifer, appreciate it. Uh, so I've been here for a long time. I came to Ottawa about 25 years ago after doing my cancer training in New York. I uh, kind of fell in love with the city, uh, the people, my patients, the hospital. And when I say the hospital, I really mean the people uh, that I work with in the hospital that I have worked with, uh, unbelievable folks. And really it's been a rewarding career. And I kind of feel like a kid. I feel like I've got an, at least another 25 more years in me. <laughs> uh, so just to explain what I do. So, uh, you know, we, we work in a very multidisciplinary group. So I represent surgeons here. So I'm a urologist, also called a urologic oncologist or a surgical oncologist. So what does that mean? So a lot, of, a lot of doctors operate on patients that have cancer. And those of us that are oncology surgeons um, do complex cancer surgery, but also integrate with the um, other experts, such as on the panel today, uh, to, to provide a more disciplinary, multidisciplinary care to our patients. So these days, patients don't just go to the operating room and then we're done. They're often treated up front with other treatments. They're treated afterwards with other treatments. Surgery is integrated with, with their other therapies. And I think that's a critical part of being a surgical oncologist. So I treat all different GU cancers. So kidney, bladder, testis, prostate specifically. Uh, not all of our patients go to surgery. So part of our practice is that we do have to kind of counsel, coordinate, discuss, make, make decisions uh, with our patients. Uh, and if it's not a surgical approach, then it's on us to help coordinate what the best care for our patients is. And we do surgeries that are anywhere from, you know, quick 30 to 60 minute up to 10 to 14 hour major open surgeries and a lot of minimally invasive surgeries, including robotic surgeries. Um, so when I started here in 1995, I was really the, the only game in town solo sort of euro-oncologist and really, I think the, what has made me very excited about my career during my career is the, it's been my honor to really develop and recruit um, a surgical GU cancer program. In addition to, you know, the other multi-D stuff you're gonna to hear today. We now have a four person euro-oncology group of surgeons that is really, I think, world-class. Um, I think the key to that as always is to recruit people much smarter than yourself and surround yourself with people that are people that are way smarter. And I think that's what I've done. And so we have, you know, we have a really productive group. Our, just the four surgeons, our production is about 40 uh, published uh, peer reviewed papers per year. And that's increasing every year. We've designed and run several grant funded surgical trials, which is fairly unusual, a surgical randomized trial. Um, but basically, I think what's really important is that we can provide our patients with uh, multidisciplinary care that is really world-class and the future looks great. We're going to have an increase in our robotic surgery, minimally invasive surgery, research is on the rise, education and integration of genetics and personalized medicine, which I think you'll hear more of to come. Oh, absolutely wonderful. I really appreciate that. And again, I can, you know, it's not a secret that you are passionate about the work you do and that you again, are continuing that theme of absolute hope, but excellence as well, which is so, so incredible to see and I think meaningful to our guests. So thank you, Dr. Morash. Dr. Ong, could I ask you to go next, please? Same, same question. Um, do you need me to repeat the question or is it okay? No, I think I'm- Wonderful, right. thank, thank you. you. So you've heard the story about the baby, <laughs> the first baby. That, that was when I was uh, training in medical oncology, uh, uh, training in uh, cancer drug development, like new drugs. 
Um, and I was training with actually one of the world leading uh, prostate cancer uh, medical oncologist, Johan de Bono. And, you know, when I, when I first started in medical oncology, all we had to offer in terms of drug therapy um, is uh, docetaxel chemotherapy. Just the, it's still something that is very pivotal in what we do. But what's incredible is that over the course of the last decade, uh, the amount of innovation that's happened. We have absolutely new um, uh, hormone therapies uh, that are very potent. We have new radiopharmaceuticals. Uh, we have new personalized medicines like PARP inhibitors and immunotherapy. And even just two days ago, we had the first report of uh, a radio pharmaceutical uh, based on PSMA. So, you know, my area of expertise is about uh, drug therapy. Um, and of course, this is nowadays not, uh, there's four of us at the Ottawa Hospital that specialize in the drug therapy part, but we work as part of this amazing team of uh, not just uh, surgeons and radiation oncologists, but the, the whole bit of us. And we need uh, all of our expertise together to try and make the best decisions for patients. A big part of my practice is, uh, is also clinical trials, like how we sort of push the envelope um, and, and, and get better treatments is doing trials. As part of trials, we have some innovative technologies like non-invasive biopsies, where we right. take biopsies from blood um, instead, and these are informing our practice. Um, and so it's it's a really exciting time. Um, it's uh, it, you know to be a medical oncologist and be part of uh, cancer prostate cancer treatment. Thank you so much for that, and so fitting to share that where we've come from and where we're going. We need to know where we've come from to, to really be able to inform what we're doing. But really, again, I would echo the same thing. You can tell that you're in the right job and uh, have such passion. And so thank you for sharing that. Uh, Dr. Morgan, uh, could you close us out and then we'll, we'll get to some questions. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank uh, I guess just by way of background, I was uh, born and raised in Alberta, but I've now lived in my, my uh, most of my life in, in Ottawa. So I uh, more time than I did in Alberta. So I'm officially an Ottawa and Ontarian and proud of that. Um, I guess my two most important roles are that I'm a, a husband and a father. I've got two kids in elementary school and pandemic aside, it's a really uh, busy and fun time of life for us. Um, in terms of my training, I initially started in, in engineering and, and uh, completed a degree, but decided it wasn't for me and pivoted to medicine and did my training. Came to Ontario for, uh, for that and then for residency and then spent a year in the UK at the same institution that Dr. Ong just mentioned as it happens, though a few years apart, and then I've been practicing here in Ottawa since uh, 2010. I guess I decided to focus on uh, prostate cancer, partly because of really formative experiences with mentors, but also really it's a, it's a disease where radiotherapy plays an important role. Uh, and so I'm a, you know, a, radi a, a genital urinary radiation oncologist. Um, this is a cancer where I think you can be involved in the care of patients at all stages of their illness and, and really have there's an opportunity to develop uh, long-term physician-patient relationships. So from a physician's point of view, there's a real, it's really gratifying and um, uh, meaningful. Um, I, academically, like Dr. Ong and Dr. Morash, I'm, I'm interested in clinical trials, and I think really nothing moves forward in oncology except with clinical trials. Um, and, and in addition to that, I've worked in, in developing clinical practice guidelines, which, which is, um, you know, the aim to disseminate the findings from clinical trials and, and, and apply them to clinical practice to truly make, make uh, beneficial changes in, in clinical practice. I love it. Thank you so much, Dr. Morgan. Really appreciate that. And again, uh, appreciate the diligence with which you do your work and uh, excited to see uh, how multifaceted that is. I think that's uh, just fantastic. So because all three of you have shared such an incredible opening remarks, I can already see that we've got quite a few questions. And so I'm going to dive right into the questions. And again, I would just encourage you to spend a moment or to answering not 10 minutes or we'll only get to two questions. So uh, Dr. Morris, I wonder if I can ask you the first question, which is what are the current guidelines recommended for PSA screening? Just quickly, I know that comes up uh, quite a bit. Sure, yeah, it's a very, uh, very popular question with our patients. Uh, so just quickly, you know, PSA has been around for about 25 years. It went through a phase of where it was out of uh, vogue and out of fashion and criticized heavily. Uh, I think really the pendulum is swinging back the other way. I think because we've done a very good job of 
stewardship of our patients, uh, making sure that we don't treat the patients that do not need to be treated and that we appropriately treat the patients that do need to be treated. Right. I think the, the current recommendations, certainly from several uh, uh, um, large bodies, including the US Preventative Services Task Force, which is probably the, 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 sort of the, the main voice, is that uh, PSA is a reasonable test. Discuss it with your physician, do an informed decision-making process, but I think PSA is, is back on the rise. Excellent. Thank you for that. Really appreciate it. Dr. Ong, I'll move to you if that's okay. Uh, can you tell us a bit about um, advancing hormone therapy and uh, how it's improving outcomes for prostate cancer patients? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, um, when we started off with hormone therapy, um, it was either by surgical means uh, or, you know, to remove um, organs that produce testosterone, like the testes, right. Uh, or by injection to remove the signal to produce uh, testosterone. So when, and we know that it's actually a Canadian discovery that hormones, uh, testosterone are critical uh, to the progression of prostate cancer. So, you know, in earlier disease states, we focus on judicious use of the uh, hormones, right? Uh, meaning uh, how do we balance the side effects of lowering testosterone versus, um, uh, uh, you know, keeping it, it around so that patients can have good quality of life. But in advanced settings, like where there's metastatic disease, uh, like what I treat, right. um, we know that blocking the hormones even stronger has a more potent effect. And almost every clinical trial that we've seen in every disease state, whether it's just PSA recurrence uh, with, uh, or, or if it's metastatic, uh, 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 prostate cancer, actually the outcomes are dramatically improved in every disease state here. So it's really quite a uh, revolution that we have these new small molecules that block things better, lower testosterone better. There's even, uh, you know, di many different formulations now. Uh, so we are definitely making an Im a huge survival impact. Um, and we're trying to understand now how to integrate uh, hormone therapies with other therapies um, I, I think the future is still bright in terms of, you know, what we can more do. But hormone therapy is still one of the most powerful therapies. I think when it works, is yeah. patients have good quality of life with good control of their prostate cancer is a win-win. Love it. Thank you for that, Dr. Ong. Uh, Dr. Morgan, I wonder if I could ask you a question here. Is ADT integrated into the radiation program as the standard of care? Yeah, so ADT, first of all, I'll define that. ADT is androgen deprivation therapy, and that's another word for essentially hormonal therapy, which is what yeah. uh, Dr. Ong was just speaking about. And really, often uh, ADT, hormonal therapy, is combined with radiotherapy, but it really depends on the particular characteristics of, of the patient's tumor and the, the risk features. So in patients who have high risk cancers, and we define risk based on the extent of the tumor on examination or on, on an MRI, or um, we also look at the, the PSA level, the blood test. And then finally, we look at something called the Gleason score, which is a measure of how aggressive the cancer cells appear under the microscope. We take account of all of those factors. And increasingly, we're starting to take account of uh, genomic and molecular factors. And based on the risk of recurrence, uh, hormonal therapy, ADT, be, can be used in combination with radiotherapy. And we know that in the, in the uh, patients with highest risk, adding in the hormonal therapy has a substantial benefit. So, so the answer is yes. Excellent. Thank you. Good question uh, from our guests. Um, uh, Dr. Morash, maybe this question next for you, because it's about robotics. And the question is, how do we expand uh, and uh, elevate our robotics program uh, with a lack of provincial support? Well, that's a great question. Uh, so the Ontario government commissioned a report looking at uh, robotics several years ago, and they came to the conclusion that they weren't sure that it was quite ready for funding. And so therefore, the way that we provide robotic surgery here is the actual robot, the, the hardware itself is provided by patient donations. And we've been very lucky to have a community that has supported us tremendously. We have a 10 year history of doing a robotics uh, here at the Ottawa Hospital in prostate cancer. 
Uh, I think the way forward is there are a couple of things. So first of all, I think we have to continue to rely on our community and our donors. Um, our hospital has been tremendously supportive of this program and in fact has built in a huge amount every year into the working operating budget to keep robotics going. And so that has been crucial and that doesn't happen every center, but it has certainly been a huge boon to us. Uh, we are looking at upgrading our robotic system. And I think there's still some hope on the horizon that the provincial government might revisit that kind of technology report. And uh, because other provinces such as Alberta have done the same report and come up with the opposite conclusions. So I think we, it's just patience and time and, uh, and our program is robust and well supported. So that's how we're keeping going. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Gosh, there's so many great questions here. I'm going to keep going. Uh, so Dr. Ong, perhaps the next question for you, uh, can you share just a little bit about immunotherapy and what it means for uh, prostate cancer patients? Uh, so there's a bit of a mixed history with immunotherapy and prostate cancer, where some of the, uh, the immunotherapies that we use now for different cancers uh, are not universally effective uh, for prostate cancer. And the reason really comes down to biology. Uh, when we are looking at immunotherapy, we're having the body essentially reject cancers because they look different than the body. They look uh, like something that's foreign, like a bacteria. Um, but not every prostate cancer actually looks that way. Actually, many look very similar to the body and therefore immunotherapy doesn't automatically uh, right. work. However, there is definitely hope on this front. First of all, when we do some kind of personalized medicine, there are some tests that we can do to identify some subset of prostate cancer that may be sensitive to standard immune checkpoint inhibitors. Right. And so that seems to be a, a low number, like 3%, uh, but we... Uh, are able to identify some of those patients. Secondly, uh, for example, I've mentioned this new PSMA type technologies. Technologies like this, where we can actually link immunotherapies to something uh, that is targeted to the prostate cell, this may be another uh, very hopeful avenue. There's certainly some presentations uh, of recent data where those kind of technologies are working. And I know that we are actually going to be participating in that um, exact research um, uh, probably at the end of this year. So, you know, I think that there's a, a, a still a lot of hope uh, about how we can bring the, the great benefits of immunotherapy to something like prostate cancer. Excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Morgan, this next question for you, and it's about the cyber knife. Um, is, it a, is it an appropriate option for uh, patients facing prostate cancer? Yeah, so uh, for those unfamiliar with it, the CyberKnife is a form of radiotherapy where the actual delivery unit is mounted on a robot. So the our conventional uh, treatment delivery units called linear accelerators are um, are stationary, but the uh, the CyberKnife can direct radiotherapy beams from from any number of angles. So what this where this has been used is in what we call ultra hypofractionated radiotherapy. And let me break that back down. There's been a, a trend through clinical trials to using fewer and fewer fractions of radiotherapy, fewer and fewer treatments. If you go back five years, we used to treat radiotherapy over a seven and a half week schedule, 37, 38 treatments over nearly eight weeks. So it's a very long course of treatment. But there's been a succession of clinical studies that have looked at somewhat shorter courses, about four weeks. Uh, these are large scale studies done across North America, done around the world, and have shown that, that it's really no different in terms of outcomes and at the significant advantage in terms of patient convenience and, and resource allocation. So the next generation of trials are looking at even shorter courses of treatment, five sessions of treatment, and that's really where the cyber knife comes in. And we are supporting right now a clinical trial where we are treating patients that, that includes the cyber knife with that five fraction schedule. So treatment could be delivered in a, in a week and a half. So a much shorter course of treatment. And I think if that study shows that um, the outcomes are equivalent to the longer course of treatment, then, then treatments with the, the cyber knife or similar to that will become a, a standard of care. I wouldn't say that it is a routine standard of care, though, for all patients right now. Fair enough. Thank you for that. You've all encouraged me to think a little bit outside of the box. So what I'm going to do is ask some of these questions and 
if whoever thinks they would be the most appropriate to answer, maybe you could jump in. Uh, what are the triggers you look for to transition from watchful waiting to active intervention? So yeah, it's, it's probably for you. Yeah, I'll take that one. Thank uh, you. So, so just some, some get the terminology clear. So watchful waiting and active surveillance are a little bit different. Watchful waiting is really what we tend to do when, uh, for example, if I find a patient who's 85 or 90 years of age and they have a low grade cancer, we just watch them. We don't tend to repeat biopsies. We don't do a lot of MRIs because the chances are that that gentleman will not ever suffer from his prostate cancer. And so we don't want to intervene and cause harm. So in a younger patient, say in their 50s or 60s, for example, who has a low grade prostate cancer, we prefer to use active surveillance, which means that we just watch, but we watch very carefully. We do repeated biopsies, we do MRIs, we do examinations, PSA tests, and we're looking for a change in the situation so that we would trigger treatment, which I think is what the gist of this question is. So the, the most common trigger for changing from active surveillance to treatment would be an increase in the grade of the cancer. So if we find a low grade cancer initially, and as we go along a year or two later, we find that it's a higher grade cancer, then we would take that patient off active okay. surveillance and treat them. Excellent, thank, thank you for that. Um, another question, um, we're hearing a bit about vaccines such as mRNA can be, uh, can be changed to target certain cancers. Is there info or research being done that would be appropriate for prostate cancer? Is there someone who might wanna tackle that answer? Yeah, that's, that's, pro that's probably me. Um, thank you. So uh, yeah, it's very interesting. Like uh, for example, the uh, Pfizer uh, company with the uh, mRNA vac COVID vaccine uh, actually started out in oncology. They have been chasing oncology drugs and uh, we actually um, have uh, trials, uh, perhaps not entirely specific to prostate cancer alone uh, that are evaluating these exact technologies. So it is a very exciting time because, you know, obviously that technology has shown to be effective in um, uh, signaling the immune system. Uh, but, you know, the technology is really an adaptation of what they were working on in cancer in the first place. So, um, you know, clinical trials are very complex. You know, you might see that we're running a clinical trial uh, online. Uh, but there, you know, there's usually a 35 point checklist as to whether you're eligible or not. And so these are detailed discussions, you know, with an oncologist uh, to even know if there's a spot on the trial, whether it's relevant. But I, I, I can tell you that these are being evaluated. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Uh, can Dr. Uh, Dr. Morris, this question is probably for you just to explain what the Ottawa Prostate Cancer Assessment Center is all about as a resource for patients? Sure. So the Cancer Assessment Center, there are actually multiple it's prostate, lung, colorectal. Um, we, we do have a, a separate breast assessment as well. So these are centers that were designed um, several years ago. And actually, you know, I think we've been way ahead of the game in Ottawa. In fact, um, even, you know, we're like 10 or 12 years in on our prostate cancer assessment center, and it's still being looked at as a, as a, um, you know, an example of how best to kind of integrate uh, the patient uh, uh, into the system. And so we have timelines, you get referred in, you'll meet with the nurse, you have a nurse navigator, we do our biopsies on site, we have state-of-the-art biopsy equipment. We've got everybody that you meet is actually trained and interested in prostate cancer and will sort of carry you through your journey type thing until we figure out the best way to make your long-term plan. So. Our Cancer Assessment Center, I think, has been extremely successful. It's an example that's been uh, built upon across the country, and we're, we're still trying to improve upon our model. Excellent. Thank you. So a great resource for sure. Uh, Dr. Morgan, I wonder for you if there is a, is it, if there's a particular clinical trial that you'd like to highlight um, that you think is particularly uh, meaningful and helpful, hopeful. Uh, we have a number of trials that are available at any particular time, but um, I guess just to, to, to emphasize that I think really our only path forward for improving therapies in, in prostate cancer and other cancers is through clinical trials. You really need to, um, whether whatever the therapy happens to be, a carefully run trial um, with 
careful follow-up in a generally a large population of, of men is, uh, is, is really what is necessary. To cite an example, I guess, of a trial that we have open right now at the Cancer Center, which is running across, across the country and it's being run by the Canadian Cancer Trials Group. This is in uh, men who's, who have advanced prostate cancer, whose cancers have spread uh, beyond the prostate to a limited number of sites, to a, at most a few sites. And uh, the standard of care for that type of cancer is hormonal therapy, just like Dr. Ong mentioned, and including incorporating some of the new hormonal therapies that, that Dr. Ong mentioned. Um, but inevitably, um, w even with those therapies, while they're very effective, there comes a time when resistance to them occurs. So the trial that we are currently offering patients, and, and I think it's important to mention that patients are guaranteed to have the standard of care of the hormonal therapy on the study. And what is being looked at is something in addition, which may further improve outcomes. And that is targeted radiotherapy directed at these few sites of cancer spread. So as imaging has improved and as computing has improved, our ability to deliver focused radiation has improved. So patients here are, have a 50% chance of receiving that additional focused radiotherapy. Uh, and we will see whether that gives longer term control or perhaps even in a, in a proportion of patients uh, a, a cure in this situation. The only way of knowing it is to do the trial. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, and maybe before we, we close, I would say there, there is a question here just asking about, is there new technology or something that really is the next thing that you, you, you'd be remiss not to share? Is there anything else that you'd uh, like to share um, in terms of what the future might hold? Dr. Morash, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, and one of the questions in the chat actually asks this question. Yeah. So we actually, I think about six or seven days ago, we had our transperineal biopsy machine land. It's been a long time coming. It was delayed a year from uh, COVID. We have a randomized trial that we are starting very shortly to look at this uh, question of transperineal versus transrectal ultrasound biopsy. But yes, so very recently we're ready to roll uh, and it, it'll be up and running shortly. Excellent, great update. Uh, anything else, Dr. Ong or Dr. Morgan that you wanted to try and squeeze in that you think uh, is helpful? Yeah, I think I've mentioned the, the PSMA type technologies, but yeah. it's really like, I think the advanced imaging of prostate cancer is going to impact us in many ways. We're, we're actually just not quite sure to do what to do with the results of right. the advanced imaging. That's what the research is ongoing. And then of course, tagging new therapies along with the imager, you know, the PSMA is incredible, but again, it's gonna take us many years of trials to figure out not only, um, you know, how to best use the one that was just presented right. at the trial that was approved, but also new compounds as well but it is an exciting time. It's fantastic. It's wonderful. And I, Dr. Uh, Morgan, I could give you 30 seconds, but then we would need to close out. Is there one final word from you? I would just add to Dr. Ong's Excellent. comment about PSMA that it really, it impacts the full range of prostate cancer from the earliest stage of diagnosis to more advanced stage. And it, it really has implications for us all. So we're excited about this ability now to image prostate cancer in a way that we couldn't before, and it's going to guide treatments um, right across the spectrum of prostate cancer. Oh, thank you so much to, to all of you. It is an absolute privilege to get to call you colleagues. It is abundantly clear that you could not be more committed to the work that you're doing. You can see from the chat that there are incredible uh, questions. Our community is engaged and wanting to know uh, uh, what uh, the, the future uh, lies ahead. I would encourage our guests to visit the resource tab on the uh, main event website so that you can see some additional resources. Thank you to all of our guests. Thank you to our donors. You are making so much possible in this city. And with that, I will turn things over to some closing remarks from our CEO. Sincere thanks to all of you. Take care.